Section 5 of Diaries, Volume 1, by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. London, 7th December, 1642. I went from Watton to London to see the so much celebrated line of communication, and on the 10th returned to Watton, nobody knowing of my having been in His Majesty's army. 10th March 1643. I went to Hartingford Berry to visit my cousin Keithley. 11th March 1643. I went to see my Lord of Salisbury's Palace at Hatfield, where the most considerable rarity, besides the house, inferior to few then in England for its architecture, were the garden and vineyard, rarely well watered and planted. They also showed us the picture of Secretary Cecil, in mosaic work, very well done by some Italian hand. I must not forget what amazed us exceedingly in the night before, namely a shining cloud in the air, in shape resembling a sword, the point reaching to the north. It was as bright as the moon, the rest of the sky being very serene. It began about eleven at night, and vanished not till above one being seen by all the south of England. I made many journeys to and from London. 15th April 1643 To Hatfield, and near the town of Hartford, I went to see Sir J. Parison's house, new built. Returning to London, I called to see His Majesty's house and gardens at Theobald's, since demolished by the rebels. 2nd May 1643, I went from Watton to London, where I saw the furious and zealous people demolish that stately cross in Cheapside. On the 4th I returned with no little regret for the confusion that threatened us. Resolving to possess myself in some quiet, if it might be, in a time of so great jealousy, I built by my brother's permission a study, made a fish-pond, an island, and some other solitudes and retirements at Watton, which gave the first occasion of improving them to those waterworks and gardens which afterwards succeeded them and became at that time the most famous of England. 12th July 1643 I sent my black menage horse and furniture with a friend to His Majesty, then at Oxford. 23rd July 1643 the covenant being pressed, I absented myself, but finding it impossible to evade the doing very unhandsome things, and which had been a great cause of my perpetual motions hitherto between Watton and London, October the 2nd I obtained a licence of His Majesty, dated at Oxford and signed by the King, to travel again. 6th November 1643 Lying by the way from Watton at Sir Ralph Whitfield's at Bletchingley, whither both my brothers had conducted me, I arrived at London on the 7th, and two days after took boat at the Tower Wharf, which carried me as far as Sittingbourne, though not without danger, I being only in a pair of oars, exposed to a hideous storm. But it pleased God that we got in before the peril was considerable. From thence I went by post to Dover, accompanied with one Mr. Thickness, a very dear friend of mine. 11th November 1643 Having a reasonable good passage, though the weather was snowy and untoward enough, we came before Calais, where as we went on shore, mistaking the tide, our shallop struck on the sands with no little danger, but at length we got off. Calais is considered an extraordinary well-fortified place in the old castle and new citadel regarding the sea. The haven consists of a long bank of sand lying opposite to it. The marketplace and the church are remarkable things, besides those relics of our former dominion there. I remember there were egg graven in stone upon the front of an ancient dwelling which was shows us these words in English, God save the king together with the name of the architect and date. The walls of the town are substantial, 
but the situation toward the land is not pleasant by reason of the marshes and low grounds about it. 12th November 1643 After dinner we took horse with the messagere, hoping to have arrived at Boulogne that night, but there fell so great a snow, accompanied with hail, rain and sudden darkness, that we had much ado to gain the next village, and in this passage, being to cross a valley by a causeway and a bridge built over a small river, the rain that had fallen, making it an impetuous stream for near a quarter of a mile, my horse slipping had almost been the occasion of my perishing. We none of us went to bed, for the soldiers in those parts, leaving little in the villages, we had enough to do to get ourselves dry, by morning, between the fire and the fresh straw. The next day early we arrived at Boulogne. This is a double town, one part of it situate on a high rock or downs, the other, called the lower town, is yet with a great declivity toward the sea, both of them defended by a strong castle, which stands on a notable eminence. Under the tower runs the river, which is yet but an inconsiderable brook. Henry the Eighth, in the siege of this place, is said to have used those great leathern guns which I have since beheld in the Tower of London, inscribed, Non Marte Opus Est Qui Non Deficit Mercurius, if at least the history be true, which my Lord Herbert doubts. The next morning, in some danger of parties, Spanish, surprising us, we came to Montreuil, built on the summit of a most conspicuous hill, environed with fair and ample meadows. But all the suburbs had been from time to time ruined, and were now lately burnt by the Spanish inroads. This town is fortified with two very deep dry ditches. The walls about the bastions and citadel are a noble piece of masonry. The church is more glorious without than within. The marketplace large but the inhabitants are miserably poor. The next day we came to Abbeville, having passed all this way in continual expectation of the volunteers, as they call them. This town affords a good aspect toward the hill from whence we descended, nor does it deceive us, for it is handsomely built and has many pleasant and useful streams passing through it, the main river being the Somme which discharges itself into the sea at saint valery almost in view of the town. The principal church is a very handsome piece of Gothic architecture, and the ports and ramparts sweetly planted for defence and ornament. In the morning they brought us choice of guns and pistols to sell at reasonable rates, and neatly made, being here a merchandise of great account, the town abounding in gunsmiths. Saint Denis. Hence we advanced to Beauvais, another town of good note, and having the first vineyards we had seen. The next day to Beaumont, and the morrow to Paris, having taken our repast at Saint Denis, two leagues from that great city. Saint Denis is considerable only for its stately cathedral, and the dormitory of the French kings, there inhumed as ours at Westminster Abbey. The treasury is esteemed one of the richest in Europe. The church was built by King Dagobert, but since much enlarged, being now 390 feet long, a 100 in breadth and 80 in height, without comprehending the cover. It is also a very high shaft of stone, and the gates are of brass. Here, while the monks conducted us, we were shown the ancient and modern sepulchres of their kings, beginning with the founder to Louis his son, with Charles Martel and Pépin, son and father of Charlemagne. These lie in the choir, and without it are many more. Among the rest, that of Bertrand du Guesclin, constable of France, in the chapel of Charles V, all his posterity, and near him the magnificent sepulchre of Francis I, with his children, wars, victories, and triumphs engraven in marble. In the nave of the church lies the catafalque or hearse of Louis the Thirteenth, Henry the Second, a noble tomb of Francis the Second, and Charles the Ninth. Above are bodies of several saints, 
below under a state of black velvet the late Louis the Thirteenth, father of this present monarch. Every one of the ten chapels or oratories had some saints in them, among the rest one of the holy innocents. The treasury is kept in the sacristy above, in which are crosses of massy gold and silver, studded with precious stones, one of gold three feet high, set with sapphires, rubies and great oriental pearls, another given by Charles the Great, having a noble amethyst in the middle of it, stones and pearls of inestimable value. Among the still more valuable relics are a nail from our Saviour's cross in a box of gold full of precious stones, a crucifix of the true wood of the cross carved by Pope Clement III, enchased in a crystal covered with gold, a box in which is some of the Virgin's hair, some of the linen in which our blessed Saviour was wrapped at his nativity, in a huge reliquary, modelled like a church, some of our Saviour's blood, hair, clothes, linen with which he wiped the Apostle's feet, with many other equally authentic toys, which the friar who conducted us would have us believe for authentic relics. Among the treasures is the crown of Charlemagne, his seven-foot-high sceptre and hand of justice, the agraffe of his royal mantle beset with diamonds and rubies, his sword, belt and spurs of gold. The crown of St. Louis covered with precious stones, among which is one vast ruby, uncut, of inestimable value, weighing three hundred carats, under which is set one of the thorns of our blessed Saviour's crown, his sword, seal and hand of justice. The two crowns of Henry the Fourth, his sceptre, hand of justice and spurs. The two crowns of his son Louis. In the cloak royal of Anne of Bretagne is a very great and rare ruby, divers books covered with solid plates of gold and studded with precious stones, two vases of beryl, two of agate, whereof one is esteemed for its bigness, colour and embossed carving, the best now to be seen. By a special favour I was permitted to take the measure and dimensions of it, the story is a bacchanalia and sacrifice to Priapus, a very holy thing truly, and fit for a cloister. It is really antique, and the noblest jewel there. There is also a large gondola of chrysolite, a huge urn of porphyry, another of chalcedon, a vase of onyx, the largest I had ever seen of that stone, two of crystal, a morsel of one of the water pots in which our Saviour did his first miracle the effigies of the Queen of Cyber, of Julius, Augustus, Mark Antony, Cleopatra and others, upon sapphires, topazes, agates and cornelians. That of the Queen of Saba has a Moorish face, those of Julius and Nero on agates are rarely coloured and cut. A cup in which Solomon was used to drink, and an Apollo on a great amethyst. There lay in a window a mirror of a kind of stone said to have belonged to the poet Virgil. Charlemagne's chessmen full of Arabic characters. In the press next the door, the brass lantern full of crystals said to have conducted Judas and his company to apprehend our blessed Saviour. A fair unicorn's horn sent by a king of Persia about seven feet long. In another press, over which stands the picture in oil of their Orleans Amazon with her sword, the effigies of the late French kings in wax, like ours in Westminster, covered with their robes, with a world of other rarities. Paris. Having rewarded our courteous friar, we took horse for Paris, where we arrived about five in the afternoon. In the way were fair crosses of stone carved with fleur-de-lis at every furlong's end, where they affirm St. Denis rested and laid down his head after martyrdom, carrying it from the place where this monastery is builded. We lay at Paris at the Ville de Venise, where, after I had something refreshed, I went to visit Sir Richard Brown, His Majesty's resident with the French King. 5th December 1643 the Earl of Norwich came as Ambassador Extraordinary. 
I went to meet him in a coach and six horses at the palace of Monsieur de Bassompierre, where I saw that gallant person, his gardens, terraces, and rare prospects. My lord was waited on by the master of the ceremonies and a very great cavalcade of men of quality to the Palais Cardinal, where on the 23rd he had audience of the French king and the Queen Regent, his mother, in the golden chamber of presence. From thence I conducted him to his lodgings in Rue Saint-Denis, and so took my leave. 24th December 1643 I went with some company to see some remarkable places without the city, as the Isle and how it is encompassed by the rivers Seine and the Ouse. The city is divided into three parts, whereof the town is greatest. The city lies between it and the university in form of an island. Over the Seine is a stately bridge called Pont Neuf, begun by Henry III. In 1578, finished by Henry IV, his successor. It is all of hewn freestone found under the streets, but more plentifully at Montmartre, and consists of twelve arches, in the midst of which ends the point of an island, on which are built handsome artificers' houses. There is one large passage for coaches and two for foot passengers, three or four feet higher, and of convenient breadth for eight or ten to go abreast. On the middle of this stately bridge, on one side, stands the famous statue of Henry the Great on horseback, exceeding the natural proportion by much, and on the four faces of a stately pedestal, which is composed of various sorts of polished marbles and rich mouldings, inscriptions of his victories and most signal actions are engraven in brass. The statue and horse are of copper, the work of the great Jean de Bologna, and sent from Florence by Ferdinand I and Cosmo II, uncle and cousin to Mary de Medicis, the wife of King Henry, whose statue it represents. The place where it is erected is enclosed with a strong and beautiful grate of iron, about which there are always mountebanks showing their feats to the idle passengers. From hence is a rare prospect towards the Louvre and suburbs of Saint-Germain, the Ile du Palais and Notre Dame. At the foot of this bridge is a water house, on the front whereof, at a great height, is the story of our Saviour and the woman of Samaria pouring water out of a bucket. Above is a very rare dial of several motions with a chime, etc. The water is conveyed by huge wheels, pumps and other engines from the river beneath. The confluence of the people and multitude of coaches passing every moment over the bridge to a new spectator is an agreeable diversion. Other bridges there are, as that of Notre Dame and the Pont au Change, etc., fairly built, with houses of stone which are laid over this river. Only the Pont Saint Anne, landing the suburbs of Saint Germain at the Tuileries, is built of wood, having likewise a water house in the midst of it and a statue of Neptune casting water out of a well's mouth of lead, but much inferior to the Samaritan. The university lies southwest on higher ground, contiguous to but the lesser part of Paris. They reckon no less than sixty-five colleges, but they in nothing approach ours at Oxford for state and order. The booksellers dwell within the university, the schools for which more hereafter are very regular. The suburbs of those of Saint Denis, Honore, Saint Marcel, Saint Jacques, Saint Michel, Saint Victoire, and Saint Germain, which last is the largest, and where the nobility and persons of best quality are seated. And truly, Paris, comprehending the suburbs, is for the material the houses are built with, and many noble and magnificent piles one of the most gallant cities in the world, large in circuit of a round form, very populous, but situated in a bottom, environed with gentle declivities, rendering some places very dirty, and making it smell as if sulphur were mingled with the mud. Yet it is paved with a kind of free stone, of near a foot square, which renders it more easy to walk on than our pebbles in London. 
On Christmas Eve I went to see the cathedral at Notre Dame, erected by Philip Augustus, but begun by King Robert, son of Hugh Capet. It consists of a Gothic fabric, sustained with 120 pillars, which make two aisles in the church round about the choir, without comprehending the chapels, being 174 paces long, 60 wide, and 100 high. The choir is enclosed with stonework graven with a sacred history, and contains 45 chapels chancelled with iron. At the front of the chief entrance are statues in relievo of the kings, twenty-eight in number, from Childebert to the founder Philip, and above them are two high square towers and another of a smaller size, bearing a spire in the middle, where the body of the church forms a cross. The great tower is ascended by 389 steps, having twelve galleries from one to the other. They greatly reverence the crucifix over the screen of the choir with an image of the Blessed Virgin. There are some good modern paintings hanging on the pillars. The most conspicuous statue is the huge colossal one of St Christopher, with divers other figures of men, houses, prospects and rocks about this gigantic piece, being of one stone and more remarkable for its bulk than any other perfection. This is the prime church of France for dignity, having archdeacons, vicars, canons, priests and chaplains in good store to the number of 127. It is also the palace of the archbishop. The young king was there with a great and martial guard who entered the nave of the church with drums and fifes, at the ceasing of which I was entertained with the church music, and so I left him. 4th January 1644 I passed this day with one Mr. J. Wall, an Irish gentleman who had been a friar in Spain and afterward a reader in St. Isidore's chair at Rome, but was I know not how getting away and pretending to be a soldier of fortune, an absolute cavalier, having, as he told us, been a captain of horse in Germany. It is certain he was an excellent disputant and so strangely given to it that nothing could pass him. He would needs persuade me to go with him this morning to the Jesuits College to witness his polemical talent. We found the fathers in their church at the Rue Saint Antoine, where one of them showed us that noble fabric, which for its cupola, pavings, incrustations of marble, the pulpit, altars, especially the high altar, organ, lavatorium, etc., but above all for the richly carved and incomparable front. I esteemed he were one of the most perfect pieces of architecture in Europe, emulating even some of the greatest now at Rome itself. But this not being what our friar sought, he led us into the adjoining convent, where having shown us the library, they began a very hot dispute on some points of divinity, which our cavalier contested only to show his pride and to that indiscreet height that the Jesuits would hardly bring us to our coach, they being put beside all patience. The next day we went into the university and into the College of Navarre, which is a spacious, well-built quadrangle, having a very noble library. Thence to the Sorbonne, an ancient fabric built by one Robert de Sorbonne, whose name it retains. But the restoration which the late Cardinal de Richelieu has made to it renders it one of the most excellent modern buildings. The sumptuous church of admirable architecture is far superior to the rest. The cupola, portico and whole design of the church are very magnificent. We entered into some of the schools and in that of divinity we found a grave doctor in his chair with a multitude of auditors who all write as he dictates and this they call a course. After we had sat a little, our cavalier started up, and rudely enough began to dispute with the doctor, at which, and especially as he was clad in the Spanish habit, which in Paris is the greatest bugbear imaginable, the scholars and doctor fell into such a fit of laughter that nobody could be heard speak for a while. But silence being obtained, he began to speak Latin, and made his apology in so good a style that their derision was turned to admiration and beginning to argue, he so baffled the professor that with universal applause they all rose up 
and did him great honours, waiting on us to the very street and our coach, and testifying great satisfaction. 2nd February 1644 I heard the news of my nephew George's birth, which was on January 15th, English style, 1644. 3rd February 1644 I went to the exchange. The late addition to the buildings is very noble, but the galleries where they sell their petty merchandise, nothing so stately as ours at London, no more than the place where they walk below, being only a low vault. The palais, as they call the upper part, was built in the time of Philip the Fair, noble and spacious. The great hall annexed to it is arched with stone, having a range of pillars in the middle, round which, and at the sides, are shops of all kinds, especially booksellers. One side is full of pews for the clerks of the advocates, who swarm here, as ours at Westminster. As one of the ends stands an altar at which mass is said daily. Within are several chambers, courts, treasuries, etc. Above that is the most rich and glorious salle d'audience, the Chamber of St. Louis, and other superior courts where the Parliament sits, richly gilt on embossed carvings and frets, and exceedingly beautified. Within the place where they sell their wares is another narrower gallery, full of shops and toys, etc., which looks down into the prison yard. Descending by a large pair of stairs, we pass by Saint-Chapelle, which is a church built by St. Louis, 1242, after the Gothic manner. It stands on another church, which is under it, sustained by pillars at the sides, which seem so weak as to appear extraordinary in the artist. This chapel is most famous for its relics, having, as they pretend, almost the entire crown of thorns. The agate patine, rarely sculptured, judged one of the largest and best in Europe. There was now a very beautiful spire erecting. The court below is very spacious, capable of holding many coaches, and surrounded with shops, especially engravers, goldsmiths and watchmakers. In it are a fair fountain and portico. The Ile du Palais consists of a triangular brick building whereof one side, looking to the river, is inhabited by goldsmiths. Within the court are private dwellings. The front, looking on the great bridge, is possessed by mountebanks, operators and puppet players. On the other part is the every day's market for all sorts of provisions, especially bread, herbs, flowers, orange trees, choice shrubs. Here is a shop called Noah's Ark, where are sold all curiosities, natural or artificial, Indian or European, for luxury or use, as cabinets, shells, ivory, porcelain, dried fishes, insects, birds, pictures, and a thousand exotic extravagances. Passing hence, we viewed the Port Dauphine, an arch of its excellent workmanship. The street bearing the same name is ample and straight. End of section five.